20-year-old Cindy Anderson showed up for work as usual on the morning of August 4th, 1981. She unlocked the door, turned on the air conditioning, answered phone calls, and went about her normal routine. But by 10 a.m., phone calls weren't getting answered. When her bosses arrived at noon, there was no sign of Cindy. And there wouldn't be a sign of her for the next 40 years. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Cindy Anderson. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us for part two of the Cindy Anderson case. So are you ready? Like you've you've gotten your theories, you've thought about it. You think, as we heard last week, that the person who abducted Cindy was somebody close to her. Oh, yeah, definitely. Somebody somebody that's that, you know, devoted of an employee and that mm-hmm. like strict by the book person. Yeah doesn't just get up and leave at 10 in the morning, you know, on her own without some, somebody luring her away. You know right. what I mean? And remember you had said that she used to keep the door locked when she was in the office, correct? Correct. So when she was alone, I think she probably kept it unlocked when, you know, th- there were other people, but yes, she always she was alone. had the door locked. Door so nobody locked. could walk, walk in on her. Right. So whoever it was, again, there's no sign of struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, she put her book down that she was reading, got up, unlocked the door willingly, Mm -hmm. took her purse and her keys, locked the door from the outside, and then left. Broad daylight. I think this is somebody that she knows and is close with. Yeah. And so I think that gives a good, we should pause before we really get into it. Cause this week we're going to be talking about the suspects that popped up in the case. But again, you gave a, you know, a pretty good overview of what happened. So just to kind of back up a little bit. And again, this is part two of the Cindy Anderson series. So if you haven't listened to part one, go back to last week's episode and do that first. But Cindy Anderson was a 20-year-old legal secretary in Toledo, Ohio. She actually lived just over the border in Michigan, about 10 miles away, and she lived with her parents still. So she was one of four children, and they were a very strict Christian fundamentalist family. So Cindy had obviously graduated high school, you know, a few years prior um, and had gotten this job at the law firm but had just put in her two weeks notice when this happened, which was August 4th, 1981. And she was going to go about 70 miles away to attend Bible college. uh, I think it was near Detroit uh, with her boyfriend, Jeff. So she was getting ready to start this like new chapter in her life. She had this boyfriend. She had a lot of friends. She was very well liked by all accounts. They're wasn't anything going on in her personal life that was causing her trouble, just kind of more peripheral weirdness happening. So she had been having recurring nightmares for the past year about somebody she knew Mm -hmm. coming to her house and then kind of like betraying her trust. You know, it sounds like the dream was like the person she knew would knock on the door. She'd invite them in. And then all of a sudden he's kidnapping and murdering her. Mm-hmm. So she's been having these dreams for about a year. And then there was graffiti that had popped up at her work that says, I love Sadiq by GW. But we went into a very long explanation about that in the last episode about how that actually does have nothing to do with Cindy. Right. 
Um, but you know, at the time she didn't know that she thought it was, so it kind of creeped her out. So it is still somewhat relevant to mention, but then more disturbingly, she had been receiving prank calls or some sort of disturbing phone call. We don't know at all what was said. Um, police were never able to actually trace these calls Mm -hmm. and find out where they were coming from. Um, but they were so disturbing that a client of the law office who was there when she received two of these calls was so concerned for her safety that he left and went home and called the police because he was concerned that something was going to happen to her. And that was the day before she disappeared. Mm -hmm. So again, like her family life is okay. Like seems okay from what we can, what we know her friends seem okay. Like she has this boyfriend that seems okay, but she has these weird, disturbing things happening in her life that she doesn't have an explanation for. And that's where we are. (laughs) Yeah. So that is where we are. And like I said, so Cindy goes missing. There aren't like a lot of clues. They don't think that she ran off because her she had a, a apparently a substantial amount of money in her bank account. Oh. Yeah, so I guess maybe she was saving up for for college or mm-hmm. whatever. But again, she worked full time and she lived at home, so she did have this brand new car, but other than that, I mean, she could probably save a lot of her money. Yeah. So I don't know how much it was, but her father did say it was substantial. So she had this substantial amount of money that she had been saving up and remained untouched in her bank account. I'm too suspicious and I'm too hung up on the father and I don't want to keep. What is, so does, what does the bank account have to do with what happened to the money? It stayed there. So it stayed there. And not only that, her parents had been also, I guess, putting money aside for her to go to school Mm -hmm. and for years, they did not have her legally declared dead because, you know, they just didn't want to believe that she was dead. And in order to free up that money, they would have had to have done that, but they never did. Okay. All right. So that to me pretty much rules out the father then. Not to say that the only motivation behind something like this would be money, but yeah. if he's, if he's bringing up in this unsolved mysteries episode that it was a substantial amount of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's motive. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. If they didn't touch it, then no, it doesn't sound, yeah, it doesn't sound like they did. It is interesting because in another one of our cases, Cherry Mahan, um, her mother who is still very actively searching for her 30 plus years later, um, did have her declared dead so that she could access some money that um, Cherry had gotten in a court settlement. And she actually used that for her son, you know, for his college education. So, you know, you do have these situations where the whole, do we declare them legally dead? Do we not is a very difficult situation that the family has to make. And I don't necessarily think that that decision indicates one way or another, if they had anything to do with it. Yeah. So where we left off was 1982. It's about a year um, after, a little less than a year after Cindy's disappearance. And the case is pretty much cold at this point. You know, they just don't have any physical evidence. They have no idea where she is. All they know is that they don't think she ran off. But that's really all they've got. But then in what seems like a completely unrelated situation, two men get arrested in Toledo in 1982. We talked in the first episode about how Toledo wasn't exactly the safest place in the world in 1981. And it goes beyond the drugs and even the murders that I've already mentioned. There were also two active serial killers working in Toledo at the time. Mm. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a podcast host as your realtor? No, of course you haven't. That would be insane. 
Hey, it's Kona here to tell you that we can make that insanity happen because I actually am a realtor based in Northern Virginia. So if you happen to live in the area, I can help you directly, but I can also help anyone around the world achieve your real estate goals because I have an amazing referral network that I work with and I help people everywhere. I also offer special incentives to veterans, to active military members, to AARP members, and so many more people. So if you are interested in buying, selling, renting, whatever it may be, all you need to do is go to my website, callcona.com, and we can connect. And I promise I will also give you all of the tea and all of the background info on this podcast if you want to. So again, that's callcona.com if you need real estate. So let's get back to the episode. Beginning in 1980, bodies started turning up. Sandra Podgorski and her boyfriend, Thomas Gordon, were abducted off the street. They were driven to a second location, and when Thomas tried to escape, he was shot to death. Sandra was raped and stabbed multiple times, but she survived her attack. She told her authorities that her attackers were two black men. Eight months later, the body of Connie Thompson was discovered. She had been raped and stabbed over 40 times. And yet another creepy coincidence in this case. In 1981, a woman named Cheryl Bartlett had been plagued by recurring nightmares. In some, she was shot, and in others, she was shot and raped. And these dreams were really starting to bother her, to the point where she didn't like to leave the house alone. But one night, she walked to meet her boyfriend, Bud Coates, after he got off of work at Kroger. And this whole time when she was going, like she had a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach, like something bad was going to happen. And then it did. As the two were walking back, they were accosted by a gunman who demanded money. And then another man came and the two of them abducted the pair. They raped Cheryl and shot her in the back, but she survived. Because she was able to give information to the police and then they were able to, you know, later do DNA and all these things. But after about 16 months, the reign of terror in Toledo ended and a pair of brothers named Anthony and Nathaniel Cook were arrested, but not before killing at least 10 people and assaulting many others. One of their victims was a 12-year-old girl named Dawn Bax. She was abducted, taken to an abandoned theater, and raped. They then murdered her by repeatedly dropping a cinder block on her head. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, so these were absolutely brutal, brutal crimes. I mean, stabbed over 40 times, you know, and brazen too, like abducting couples, you know, and uh, like abducting just people in the middle of the street and complete stranger. Like, it's just crazy. And this went on again, like through 1980, 81, And then luckily they were, you know, they were arrested. After the arrest, police started to look at the Cook brothers for multiple unsolved homicides, disappearances, rapes, you know, everything, including Cindy's. After all, she had disappeared from the same area and in the same time that the brothers were operating. So prosecutors offered the brothers a deal. Anthony, who was considered to be the driving force behind these attacks, would spend his life in prison. But Nathaniel, who they saw as more of an accomplice, like they don't think he actually participated in all of the murders. He could get out in 20 years if the brothers confessed to all of their rapes and killings. But, you know, with the caveat that if they were proved to be lying, that the deal was off and they'd, you know, get whatever punishment they were originally going to get. So the police consulted with some of the victims and their families, and they decided to go ahead with this deal. And the police brought several cases to the brothers, like I said, including Cindy's. And so they kind of went through them and, you know, they taped this whole thing. But 
they denied having a hand in most of these cases that were brought to them. But they did admit to murdering a woman named Vicki Small all the way back in 1973. Mm. But they denied having anything to do with Cindy's disappearance. I mean, if they're copying to other murders, why wouldn't they admit to killing Cindy if they did? Right. And that's, yeah. And that's a very good point. But because, yeah, on one hand, why lie at that point at all? But on the other hand, one of the cases that police think the brothers perpetrated was the murder of 19 year old Michelle Hoffman. Investigators believe that the Cook brothers refused to admit to that one because Michelle was the niece of a Toledo detective named Tom Ross. And their theory is that the brothers thought they would have a more difficult time in prison if they admitted to killing a police officer's relative. And not that Cindy was a police officer's relative or anything like that, but police do think that they aren't copying to all of the murders. And the other thing is, so they admitted to this one mid- murder, Vicki Small in 1973, and then committed 10 plus murders between 1980 and 1981 in the 16 month period. So like we're, I guess, supposed to believe that they were totally above board between 1973 and 1980. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it, uh, in, previous cases that's that's not it's not the way serial killers operate right typically and unless there's some dramatic change in their life uh where they take a few years off or whatever Mm -hmm. um but they also typically don't start out as brutal right as that without some sort of escalation Right. So if their first murder that they admitted to was in 73, I've got to think there are many rapes before that. Previous to that, yes. And And who knows if they were even ever reported. So, I mean, they might not even be on the books as unsolved. So there's probably that. Mm -hmm. And then I have to imagine, again, because of the number of attacks and the absolute brutality of the attacks in 80 and 81, I just don't see that starting out of thin air. Right. Yeah. And that's what, that's where I was going with yeah. this escalation aspect of, of how so- serial killers operate. They probably did all kinds of terrible stuff mm-hmm. in between the, those, those two cases. And for whatever reason, they're not copying to it. Yeah. I don't know. This just, it bothers me, you know, because on one hand, I do think you're right about, you know, it probably being somebody Cindy knew because, you know, how else would they have gotten her out of there? We should also mention, like, these brothers are huge. Like, Nathaniel, the one who um, got less time in prison, was like 6'5 and close to 400 pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, just a giant imposing person, right? And with Cindy being as paranoid as she was... Like, I don't think she would just randomly let people in that she didn't know to the office, right? So the only way I think it would make sense for the brothers to have gotten a hold of her is if, like, she had already left for another reason and they snatched her outside of the office. But then it goes back to your question from last week, which is why would she had voluntarily left the office at 10 a.m.? Right. You know, because that doesn't sound like something that she would do. And so then how does that timing work out if that's not her normal routine? And, you know, do they just happen to be there? And and in a lot of these cases that they did perpetrate, like it really was the victims were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I can kind of see that happening. It's just it's it's really I don't feel completely comfortable 100 percent ruling them out. Well, I mean, you can't 100% rule them out yeah. because this does fit their MO. Right. But they never hit any of the other bodies. Yep, and that was another thing that bothered me too, that these bodies were found. Presumably, right? Maybe they did hide some and they just never got 
attributed to them. Like, who knows? Like, maybe they murdered somebody else and hit them and family just thought that they ran off and started a new life. Like, I just don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, but why hide some and not others? No, it, yeah. And that is a very good point. You're right. I mean, because it does sound like the bodies were found relatively easily by passersby, you know, not by like people who are doing a concerted search trying to find a body. But while they were the first viable suspects in Cindy's disappearance, they weren't the last. In 1995, a long-running drug ring was busted up by federal authorities. Nine people were indicted by a federal grand jury. Now, you know, Cindy had never done drugs. She was never uh, involved in drug dealing or anything illicit at all. So who cares about a drug ring in which nine people were indicted? Well, I would imagine you're about to tell us. (laughs) Well, two of the people indicted in this case were Jose Rodriguez Jr. and Richard Neller. Now, it's been a while, but do you remember the name of the law firm where Cindy worked? No. The Neller and Rabbit Legal Center. Ah, interesting. Richard Neller was one of Cindy's bosses. Hmm. And Jose Rodriguez was his client. Okay. So Cindy's boss was a drug kingpin. Basically, the way that this story went is that Jose Rodriguez was Neller's client and, you know, was a drug trafficker Um, and, you know, had obviously got arrested a bunch. Right. So he had a lawyer. And what ended up happening was that Neller kind of started advising Jose on how to run his business and not get caught basically. And he would like tamper with witnesses. And I mean, it was basically like a movie mob lawyer is, is really, I mean, it just, it's, it's so crazy, but yeah, he just started working with his client and started like trafficking drugs. Okay. So that gets us to drugs. And yes, of course there's violence associated with drugs, Mm -hmm. but what would be the motivation to kidnap and or kill Cindy? Well, there have been a couple of theories that I saw on this. The first one that I read is that Rodriguez and Neller had a falling out because I guess, you know, like Rodriguez ended up serving some jail time and blamed Neller for that, right? You know, he's his lawyer and business partner. And if Rodriguez went down, like, you know, he kind of had a grudge against Neller for that. Um, so the theory was that he murdered Cindy to send a message. I guess my, my issue with that is if you're, if you're going to kill somebody to send a message, why wouldn't you leave the body somewhere? Right. And that's what police said. They're like, it's not a very good message if yeah. we don't know where she is, yeah, you know, exactly. like I, I just, that was like I said, the theory, but that was the problem with it. Because typically in these situations, you know, you leave the message on the door, you know, you leave the body on the doorstep or, or something like that. Or, or yeah, kill her in the office. Right. Or, and also it's like, I don't, you know, not to be rude, but like she's a secretary. Like I have to think that maybe there was somebody closer to Neller that they maybe could have gone to if they really were just trying to send a message. That that just doesn't fit with me. Yeah. It doesn't fit with me either. And so that, like I said, that was the first version of this that I read. And at that point I'm like, well, I'm back with the serial killers. (laughs) Like I think it's the cooks at this point, if that's all you've got, like, I don't think that, you know, some random drug dealer killed her to send a message, right? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. Right. But the actual indictment lays out another theory, that Neller and Rodriguez committed the crime together. Okay, so I'm assuming the indictment is going to explain why? Yes. Because I'm still missing that component. Now... So far, I I would agree with that because I think that she's more likely to get up and leave with Neller Mm -hmm. because 
he's her boss. So there's the familiarity, right? Yeah, exactly. But why? I'm okay. Mi- I'm missing the why. According to the indictment, quote, on August 4th, 1981, Jose C. Rodriguez Jr., Richard Neller, and other persons known to the grand jury but not indicted herein, abducted and murdered Cynthia Anderson, Richard Neller's legal secretary, because she had overheard conversations wherein Jose C. Rodriguez Jr. and Richard Neller had discussed armed robberies and their expanding drug business, end quote. Where are they getting that from? Like, what is, is there any... An informant. Evident? Okay. Yeah, so apparently this came from an informant who says that Rodriguez admitted murdering Cindy to him. Is this a jailhouse snitch? Yes. Okay. (laughs) So there's inherent problems with that. Yes. There are inherent problems with that. And that did show up. I mean, and his testimony was deemed to not be credible. But out of all of the theories, this one does make the most sense to me. Because again, like, all right, so... Going back to Rodriguez committing this murder on his own, like beyond the fact that we what we just covered, which is that it doesn't send a message at all and it doesn't make sense, Cindy would not have willingly gone with some skeevy drug dealer client, right? I mean, she presumably knew him, right? But wouldn't have trusted him in any way, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, would not have willingly gone with him and if he were the one responsible for this, or if he and one of the, you know, as they say in the indictment, like a person known to the grand jury, but not indicted herein, if, you know, Rodriguez and one or more of those people had come in to forcibly take Cindy, you just would have seen signs of that. Right. But there weren't as we've been over. So I just don't think so. But like you said, if it was her boss, who came in with or without this client, like, you know, Rodriguez didn't have to physically be there at that point, right? It could have just been Neller and he could have just come in and said like, Hey, Cindy, I need you for X, Y, or Z. And Cindy being the obedient, conscientious person that she is would have no reason to not go with Neller. And either she would have locked the door behind her or he would have. Right. And there wouldn't have been any sign of a struggle and there wouldn't have been any reason for her to take anything except for her purse and her keys. You know, she left her book face down on her desk because she thought she was going to be back. She didn't take any more money out of her account because why would she need it? She didn't pack any clothes. She didn't take her makeup because... Why would she? It was just a normal day at work. So the jailhouse snitch was deemed to be not credible. Mm -hmm. So we're still back with the why. Okay. But even if the jailhouse snitch wasn't credible, and maybe he wasn't credible because maybe Jose Rodriguez didn't confess this, right? Because why would he? Like these jailhouse confessions drive me crazy. I mean, I just have a hard time believing that people are that dumb, especially Jose Rodriguez, who is such a career criminal, by the way, that um, one of the nine people who were indicted in this was Jose Rodriguez, the third. And since he's Jose Rodriguez Jr., I have to imagine that that's his son. Mm. So Rodriguez is doing this with his son. And by the way, while I was trying to find more information on what happened to Rodriguez after this. Um, You know, I Googled his name, which was kind of tough because Jose Rodriguez is a pretty common name. Yes. But I did see another mention of a a Toledo area man named Jose Rodriguez III, who was just busted in another major drug trafficking operation just a few years ago. Anyway, my point is, is that this guy has clearly 
been around the block a time or two. So yes, I do find it hard to believe that he would be dumb enough to just admit to kidnapping and murder while he's sitting in jail waiting for a drug trial. Mm -hmm. However, to me, that doesn't mean that this didn't happen. I don't think that he confessed to it, but I think that this very well could be a reasonable explanation. You know, like if Neller, who was a well-liked and well-respected member of the community, very popular. I mean, he had everything going for him. And if he thought that Miss Dugarter over here heard something she wasn't supposed to, and her father, Michael Anderson, even told um, reporters in 95, after this whole thing was kind of, you know, brought up, he told reporters, he's like, yeah, if Cindy had heard anything, if she knew that her boss was trafficking drugs, she absolutely would have told the police. Like that's not a a secret she would have kept because her moral compass was such that she couldn't. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, I see, I see your point. Um, if that were the case, but, if if she had such a strong moral compass and overheard something, you know, th- this doesn't seem like if, if this is the running theory, mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like this was something that happened spontaneously. The the kidnapping and murder, like this was planned. They planned something, mm-hmm. right? So why wouldn't she have already gone to the police? Well, maybe she was conflicted about it, right? Like maybe she had heard something, but didn't know exactly what to do or really what it meant or anything. You know, maybe she was conflicted. Maybe it wasn't like she heard it on August 3rd and then was gone on August 4th. Maybe she had been trying to figure out what to do. And because she had already put in her two weeks notice, maybe she was thinking like, let me just get out of here first and then do something about it. Yeah, maybe. See, it, it, because like I thought you would have been all over this theory because you said that, you know, you thought from the beginning that it was somebody that she knew. Yeah, but I guess my problem with it is that it just seems like a reach. Does it seem more of a reach than anything else, though? No, but... I'm just not, I'm not a hundred percent sold on it Yeah, because, you know, again, we're, we're talking about a, a jailhouse informant. I don't, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> yes, all the pieces fit more neatly, mm-hmm. but I just feel like if, if she had heard something she wasn't supposed to, mm-hmm. given how she was, I feel like she would have either gone to the police or if she, or, or if she was so afraid that she's locking the front door that she wouldn't have stayed there. Like she's already given her two weeks. Yeah. So this is not a career, Mm -hmm. you know, she's going into college. She's terrified because she's having these dreams. Right. Mm -hmm. And like I said, she's locking the door behind her because she doesn't want to be alone in the office. Why does she stay? A sense of duty. And then if and then if she's scared and Neller shows up, yes, her boss, but if she overheard something and she knows Neller's implicated, does she open why does she open the door? Because he's her boss. Like he she has to open the door. Like that's literally a part of her daily routine. Is the bosses come, she opens the door, they go to work. All right. So where was Neller? around that time frame then? I don't know. And so that's the frustrating part about this because aside from this indictment and then, you know, the witness being claimed not credible, I don't know how deeply the police actually dug into this after that. Like I I couldn't find anything about him being 
interviewed about this. I couldn't find anything about Rodriguez being interviewed about this past this whole, you know, grand jury Mm -hmm. situation. So I don't know. I don't know what his alibi is. Like, I don't know where he was or wasn't around that time. The only additional information that I have about this is that police and whether this is based on that informant or something else did believe that they really knew what happened to Cindy. Like it seemed like they really kind of specifically said, okay, this is what happened because they thought too, that she knew where she was buried. And so right after this whole thing happened, they started new searches for Cindy. The place that they started searching was this pond in Perrysburg, which is a Toledo suburb. And I think, think that's Perrysburg is actually where Rodriguez lived because when I found that other article about the man who I think is his son, it said that he was a Perrysburg resident. I don't know. So they started looking around this pond in Perrysburg. Michael Anderson, her father said that police told him that that's where they thought she was. But when they did that search, they didn't uncover anything. Interesting. Yeah. So what I kind of think is that this is one of those situations where because they didn't find Cindy when they did that search, that's why we haven't seen any arrests or anything in this because at this point, they still don't have any physical evidence. They have a theory of a crime that's bolstered by nothing. Right. And I guess that's the reason why I have a problem with it. Yeah. Be- because it, it is bolstered by nothing. Right. It's, okay, so they have her boss being involved with drugs. hmm But, uh, again, this so- it's, it's a theory at this point. There's no, there's no solid connection saying that because he was involved with drugs that he kidnapped and killed his secretary. Right. So but that, that's the problem that I'm having with it. Not that I want to bring up the Christian Smart case in every episode, but that's what we had for over 20 years in her case was this theory that Paul Flores took her and killed her and buried her with no physical evidence to back it up. We had a theory of a case for decades and then we finally got the physical evidence to back it up. And now we have two arrests yeah, so I mean, that's I true. That's unfortunately, true. I, I mean, I think, I'm not I'm not knocking the cops, and I'm not knocking no, the, yeah. the the pursuit of of this. But I just I, again, it's it's a theory that mm-hmm. is not backed up by anything, right? And you're absolutely right. And so, unfortunately, because we have no physical evidence, no DNA, nothing, this probably won't go anywhere unless we can find some physical trace of Cindy. Right. Or, you know, we can get whoever is involved, whether it's Sneller or whether it's Rodriguez, whether it's whoever, to talk. And they do have some leverage here, police, because Neller, not so much with Neller. So... Well, he's a lawyer. I mean... Yeah, both men, well, not anymore. Um, Both men were convicted of many felonies related to this whole drug trafficking scheme. Neller was sentenced to 70 months in prison, and he was released in 2001. After his release, he lived in a halfway house and worked for a time as a paralegal. And so during this whole thing, like when he was convicted of these felonies, the uh, Ohio State Bar suspended his law license indefinitely. And then after he was released and he was working as a paralegal, like he tried to get it reinstated basically. Um, And he had like all these character witnesses talking about how great he was and how he was like a great activist for the Hispanic community. And, and he was well-respected by getting them involved in drugs. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I I thought that was funny too, but anyway, so um, it didn't work and Neller was, officially disbarred in 2003. But I have not heard a single word about what happened to Neller after 2003 
And I'm really interested in that. I want to know what happened to that guy. Um, I do know what happened to Rodriguez. He is still in jail, in prison rather, because he was sentenced to 465 months in prison. Okay. And I had Alexa tell me how many years that yeah, was. Yeah, I don't know. It's either. like 38 and a half. 38 and a half. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So quite a while. But like I said, his son, who was also indicted, is like, he was uh, sentenced like 64 months or something like that. And so he was out and now, but he's back because of this other drug trafficking uh, scheme. So... To me, I mean, Rodriguez has a very long sentence. The other Rodriguez, who may or may not be involved in this whole Cindy thing, but was involved in the original drug trafficking scheme, you know, he's now facing, I think, a pretty long sentence. So to me, there might be a little something for the police to work with there, right? Like maybe a little reduction in this drug sentence if we can bring Cindy home. Yeah. Yeah. But I, again, I don't know if that's an avenue that's being explored in any way or if after that indictment kind of fizzled out on the Cindy front, if the whole investigation fizzled out. Because despite these convictions, like Cindy's case does seem to have stalled. I haven't found any updates beyond this. I don't know if police did any searches after the one by the pond in Perrysburg, or if, like I mentioned before, if they've tried to re-interview either of these men or, you know, Rodriguez's son or any of the other nine who are involved in this criminal conspiracy. Both of Cindy's parents passed away without having any answers either. Her mother, Margaret, died just two years later in 1983 of cancer. And so that's why, like, all these articles that I was reading, you know, were just with her father. Um, it, but he also passed away in 2008. He spent many, many years just hoping that Cindy was out there alive somewhere. You know, we mentioned him not having her legally declared dead. You know, he said in that unsolved mysteries episode that he thinks, well, maybe she's out there living somewhere with amnesia and she'll just call me one day and say, I remember and I'm coming home. But by the time he passed in 2008, it seems that he had come to the conclusion that his daughter was not alive anymore. His obituary read in part, quote, Mike was also preceded in death by his daughter, Cynthia Anderson, end quote. With both of her parents gone, it's unclear if the remaining Anderson family will ever get answers or ever get justice for the beloved sister. So for now, Cindy remains out there and her killer or killers continue to elude punishment. Cynthia Jane Anderson has been missing since August 4th, 1981, from Toledo, Ohio. She was 20 years old at the time of her disappearance. She would be 60 years old today. Cynthia was 5 foot 4 and 115 pounds. She had short, curly brown hair and brown eyes. She had a chickenpox scar on her forehead and a fish-hooked shaped scar on the inside of her right knee. If you have any information about what happened to Cindy Anderson, please contact the Toledo Police Department at 419-245-3151. You can see all the sources for this episode, along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. 
Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster Production. Hey, you can do it!